So let's move along the line. Mara Yamauchi, as you were coming in, you may well have looked up and seen the, uh, the photos we had yesterday from Mara making her, well, I might say, triumphant arrival from a, her and Shige's adventure um, through foreign lands. Um, I must say, Mara, before we get on to your, you know, your, your shape, that um, uh, resourcefulness, which Dave Bedford paid tribute to, your resourcefulness, and Shige's um, this morning, um, there must have been, in that adventure, maybe some funny moments, perhaps, <laughs> along the way? Um, yes, it was, it was a long and, let's say, interesting journey. <laughs> uh, it took us just about a week to get from New Mexico to, to London. Um, it, was, it was very tough at points. There were, there were times when I thought, we wouldn't, we wouldn't make it to London by Sunday. And then there were times when I thought I would be the only person to come make it by Sunday and I would win by 10 minutes. <laughs> and then sort of everything in between. Um, and, I mean, as everybody knows, you know, all the trains, buses, ferries, everything was full, were full. Um, so getting, getting from one point to the next, once we arrived in Europe, in Lisbon, was, was pretty hard work, but I'm just relieved to be here and uh, just trying to switch my brain from transport logistics to running fast. <laughs> After last year's London, as your quote was, taking a big chunk off your, your PB, personal best, things didn't go quite as you hoped, did they? Because you had two foot injuries, both in the right foot. You had to do cross training, you missed the World Championships. That time away from the competition, have you reassessed in any way your approach to the marathon? Um, I guess when you have an injury, it's a, it's a signal, it's a warning sign to you that you know, you're overdoing it or you're not doing something quite right. So in that sense, it was useful. And I, when I could finally run again and the injury had pretty much healed, I, I returned to training quite slowly to make sure I didn't get any further injuries. Um, and now I try and listen to my body more and just, you know, if, if I feel like something's going to gonna go, then I'll, I'll back off my training and just make sure I, I stay in one piece. The last race, uh, March 21st in New York, the New York Half Marathon, winning that, coming from behind to overhaul Dina Castor, uh, must have given you a big confidence boost. It was a, a big confidence boost. I, Dina went off very, very quickly and... Uh, it wasn't till about 12 miles that I went into the lead. And so for the first 12 miles, I, I thought, you know, I'm getting thrashed here. This is really not very good. <laughs> but uh, suddenly things turned around and uh, I, was, I managed to stay strong at the end and it was a reasonable time on quite a tough course. The first 12K or so was in Central Park, which is very hilly. So I was quite pleased with, with the time. Do you feel in the kind of form to take another big chunk off your best? I think a big chunk is, is unlikely. <laughs> uh, it would be fabulous if I could do another PB. Uh, I think it depends really on the weather. If the weather is good for us and uh, not too hot, um, favourable wind behind us for most of the race, and, and if the, the pacing to halfway works you know, to my advantage, then, then I think I could do a PB. just wonder what this kind of travel disruption does for preparation to you for your run, both physically and mentally? Uh, we'll find out on Sunday. <laughs> um, physically, it was, it was pretty exhausting. I mean, we were, we've been on flights and in cars since... Um, pretty much continuously f since Saturday evening. And then before that, we had one flight on Thursday. So we had Friday on dry land. <laughs> Um, so physically it was really tiring then we spent loads of time trying to find another flight a rental car whatever so we didn't have much time to sleep or I hardly did any training because I just didn't have time um, you know we couldn't even find have time for meals really we were just grabbing sandwiches here and there so physically it was quite tiring mentally it was also quite tiring sort of, you know sorting out the journey wondering if we would get there or not and so on but on the positive side, I wasn't really worrying about the race. Um, when you're tapering for a marathon, you have more energy to think about things, and it's easy to, to, to worry too much about a race. But I haven't really thought about the race at all. So in that respect, it's good. And um, having, 
you know, it's been a sort of mental roller coaster. So having finally got here, if I run well on Sunday, uh, you know, it'll be fantastic. It'll be the icing on the cake. Um, but I, I've never prepared for a race like this before, obviously, <laughs> in terms of the journey, but also the training I've done or not done. Um, so I just have to try and optimize my preparation from now until Sunday and hope I'm sufficiently rested and see what happens on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Give us some sort of idea about what you'll be up to between the next sort of 48 hours, how this has changed your preparations? I, I, uh, I, I need to rest as much as possible. Um, I mean, for, four for the last four nights, apart from last night, we probably had about four or five hours sleep, so just catching up on sleep, doing a bit of running to get, get the muscles moving again. Um, and otherwise, just usual things, so carbo-loading, hydrating, um, looking what the weather's likely to be, thinking about what strategy I'll use in the race. So just trying to get my strength back. <laughs> Just finally one from on, on the actual journey. Was it was there anything that you, you did sort of you know keep, help pass the time? I mean, you know, you just sort of having to uh, to you know listen to CDs and stuff, or just to you know to keep your mind off the fact that you had such yeah. a long journey ahead of you. Um, well, we, I mean, there was fantastic weather and fabulous scenery. <laughs> you know, on the pos positive side, had this not happened, I would never have seen everything from Lisbon, Madrid, Bordeaux, Paris, Le Touquet, <laughs> Shoreham, um, up to London. So, um, and, you know, some of it was gorgeous. And we happened upon a lovely hotel in France to stay over one night. So um, that helped pass the time. Um, helping my husband with French pronunciation passed a, few, <laughs> a bit of time. Um, what else? Um, yeah, just trying to get to the next place, making sure we didn't go wrong. Um, uh, wondering if I should buy a crate of wine and foie gras for Dave Bedford or not. <laughs> Thinking, okay, if we have to go on the train, then we don't want to have extra luggage. If we're getting a plane organised by the London Marathon, then somebody else will be carrying our luggage so we can get some. So all those kind of things. <laughs> so you didn't buy I bought some and gave it to Glenn Latimer, who did all the hard work with, and, and his colleague Ian, who did all the hard work with trying to find us Eurostar tickets, trains, etc., etc. And the label says Le Touquet Airport, Aeroport, which, is, which I thought was quite cool. <laughs> but that was it. Hi, Mara. <laughs> was there a particularly absurd moment in this trip where you just couldn't really believe you were doing what you were doing? <laughs> Um, there were quite a lot of moments like that, actually. Um, uh, when we arrived in Lisbon, we, we thought, OK, fine, we're in Europe. Let's try and get a train or a, a train to Madrid. And there, you couldn't find information anywhere. So Shige said, let's get a taxi. <laughs> and I thought, hang on, this is going to cost quite a lot of money. <laughs> and he said, never mind, you know, we've got to get to the marathon. Dave Bedford will pay, surely. <laughs> Let's go. So we got in this taxi, and the taxi driver said, I'm so happy you're in my taxi. I'm going to earn a week's wages with you in my taxi. And my uncle lives in Madrid, so I'm going to have a great night. So, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> then the taxi driver from Paris to Latouque was a... Cambodian man in his 60s. And of course, I was distressing about getting to the Latuke airport for most of the journey. And then at the end, I thought, hang on, this man's Cambodian in his 60s. So I said to him, you know, when did you leave Cambodia and come and live in France? And he said, oh, you know, way back. And I lost all my family, my wife, all my children in the war in Cambodia. And that kind of put life's ups and downs in perspective <laughs> for us. So that was quite interesting. <laughs> 